Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Ronald J. Colombo, Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Distance Education at the Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. We will discuss his 2013 article, The Naked Private Square, which appeared in the Houston Law Review, as well as his current work on corporate religious liberty. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Ron. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. And um, it's great to talk to you again. I've known you for, for such a long time now. Yes, it's a reunion of sorts, isn't this? <laughs> yes, yes. It's, I feel like I'll, 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 I'll play the law student again um, <laughs> as, as I interview you. Okay. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this paper, which is um, especially timely given um, recent events in the Supreme Court. Um, so I, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on, on subsequent developments. But I was wondering if you could, if you could start by just explaining the nature of the title of the article. It's a great title, but I'm not sure people will necessarily immediately know exactly what it means. So maybe you could give them a little context by explaining what you mean by the naked public square. Oh, thank you so much for that first question. Uh, this is probably the best title I've ever come up with and may very well be the best title I ever come up with. So I, I may have peaked too early in my career uh, as an academic. And, and the reason I'm so proud of this particular title, it's a play on a very famous book in some circles uh, by Richard John Newhouse. Uh, There's a book that came out decades ago called The Naked Public Square. Richard John Newhouse was a Lutheran minister. He was uh, a person of some prominence during the civil rights movement. He later converted uh, to Catholicism and became a Catholic priest and he was the founder of the influential magazine, uh, First Things. Mm. And uh, the, the Naked Public Square was his book that um, discussed and analyzed the phenomenon in American life of the relegation of matters religious uh, into the private spaces of our of our lives and and away from public and away from public view and this was an i mean the, the best example of this would be the taking down of ten commandments monuments the uh the the prohibition on prayer in public school all the church state uh fights that we've we've witnessed in in, in the last few decades uh, his book sort of chronicled those. And, uh, and and forcefully laid out the position that this was really not the intent of the, the founding uh, fathers and the framers of the Constitution. So um, I'm not a constitutional law scholar. My background is corporate law. That was my background in private practice. And my, uh, my scholarly agenda has to do with corporate and business law. And uh, the Naked Private Square is a play on that title in that, okay, it's one thing, and I'm not going to debate whether or not there should be a crash put up, uh, you know, in, in town hall or not. That's, that's really not my forte or my area of expertise. What I was fascinated with was the, the, pheno the parallel phenomenon, or the, I should say the consequent phenomenon of um, religion being pushed out of private spaces in public, you know, such as uh, malls, such as, you know, the businesses, um, you know, it's the, the, the quote unquote war on Christmas, right? Where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, co companies are afraid to uh, say Merry Christmas. Now it's all happy holidays. Um, and, and further, uh, there's been legislation introduced and there was, uh, there was a piece of legislation in New Jersey that passed where uh, proselytization, uh, pr proselytization at the workplace was banned as uh, you know discriminatory and making the the environment let's say hostile toward uh, non-believers or believers of a different faith and i found this a very f interesting phenomenon and and a lot of the arguments that people use to support uh, this sort of uh, th these developments were very similar to the church state arguments with regard to establishment clause issues such as you know the government can't be uh, endorsing religion well the establishment clause does not apply to a private business corporation yet yet establishment clause values if that's fair to say seem to have been permeating that space right and so you you saw this we we've all seen it and we witnessed the the um sort of the exclusion of faith in, in, in the, the workplace environment to a greater degree over the last few decades. And so my title was, I thought, a very, uh, and again, I'm proud of it, and, and, and I, you know, I, I'm not one to boast, but I'm happy to do so here because I don't think I'll top it. But I, I really mm. do think this title really captures the essence of the situation I was examining in this article, namely uh, 
the, uh, the, the exclusion of religion and faith in the workplace, in the private sector uh, on, an, on a sort of an increasing level. Yeah. So it, it, if I may, it has become kind of a article of faith, as it were, in some circles that religion doesn't or shouldn't have a place in private business corporations. And one of the things that I thought was interesting in your article is sort of the way you trace the history of the business corporation and really, I think, pretty effectively showed how that's a very recent development. I was wondering if you could explain that history a little bit for listeners. Oh, my pleasure. Um, again, just to be clear, the thing that I found so interesting about this phenomenon is that it was it was sort of um, motivated by constitutional values that are just not applicable in this space. And so I asked myself, how did it come to how did we come to this? Why is it that there's this sense that you know work and religion ought not mix? And I, I think the reason is, quite frankly, just the the diversity of the modern 21st century or the 20th century when this was happening, uh, American and Western work workforce. Right? Uh, you have people of a variety of religious uh, backgrounds, people that are anti, you know, let's say hostile to religion included in that mix, people that don't care one way or the other. It's quite a polyglot collection of um, folks you have working under one roof, let's say. And it was seen the same way you don't want to discuss religion and politics, let's say. Well, it was similarly put that, you know, uh, the happy worst workplace is the workplace that's sort of devoid of religion because religion brings about friction and conflict. Um, and, and you know what? That might be very well true at, at the vast majority of workplaces in, in, in the Western world today. I, I, I'm not challenging that. But as you point out, Brian, historically, that's not the case. And I think that's because historically, time, uh, in, in historically, nations, uh, states, countries were, were, were more homogenous when it came to matters of religion. And so it would not be unusual to have, uh, you know, work and faith sort of intertwined, uh, just because the the workforce was all drawn from a very homogenous group of folks. And, and, and part of that hom- homogeneity would be uh, religious commonality, right? right? A common faith. And so uh, yes, and and also going back even you know centuries before the industrial revolution, of course, where most folks were agricultural, the, the whole concept of separating, you know, work and faith, or or you know even like today the the, the what do they say the 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 faith work uh, not faith the work uh, life balance that was kind of unknown to the to folks of yesteryear, right? Because you worked on your farm, and and whether you're you know changing the the feed for the the, the pigs or changing a diaper on your kid, it's 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 all the same sort of subset, you know, the same basket of responsibilities that you have to deal with. And so, mm. traditionally, you know, I, I mankind did not separate his or her faith from his or her uh, work or vocation, if you will. Uh, that's a I would say post twentieth uh, post industrial revolution phenomenon that's that's exacerbated in in recent times because of the explosion in religious pluralism. Yeah. And one thing that struck me was how you pointed out that until relatively recently, um, corporations were primarily, if not almost exclusively, actually religious entities, not not, not secular ones. Okay. Now we're going to – yes, yes, right. If you dig back deeper into the history of the uh, the corporation as an organization, that is entirely correct. I mean um, – and 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 this goes over. This spans millennia, right? Uh, you know, back to ancient times and the and sort of private work, business associations. But yes, uh, typically the state would only grant what we would now consider a corporate charter to undertakings that were, uh, I would say. Uh, of a religious nature would be very common, like to build a church or to run a cemetery, but also public works type things like to build a bridge or a school or um, uh, the United States, for example, was colonized largely by uh, British business corporations, right? Uh, The East India Company and and stuff like that. So uh, the, the business corporation has a very interesting past where the modern notion of it existing purely for the sake of Profit maximization uh, to the benefit of private investors is 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 not typical in it of its of its history. That's sort of a modern phenomenon. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and it it also struck me as as an odd development that seems like people don't necessarily think through the implications all the way. Being that you know, as you discuss in your paper, 
um, you know, most, if not almost all charitable organizations, which certainly <laughs> predominantly includes religious organizations, uh, depending on how you count it, um, people accept, you know, as a matter of course, that charitable organizations can engage in religious speech and in religious association and that they have um, freedom of expression and freedom of association rights. Um, and, and it seems odd to say that charitable organizations, which the government actually indirectly subsidizes and puts all kinds of limitations, substantive limitations on on their actions could engage in this kind of speech where business corporations, which the government is largely hands off. And typically we think of them as having the broadest range of freedom of activity possible would somehow be excluded from this one area of activity. No, that, that's a great, that's a great observation. Yes. Uh, I personally, as you could see, uh, as you have seen in reading the article, the divide between the for-profit and non-profit corporation is not something that I see as, as, as clear as others, right? I mean, all corporations exist to, to raise revenue. And, and the question is what they do with that revenue, right? A business corporation plows uh, enough back into its operations as is necessary to keep the business thriving and expanding. And anything above and beyond that is distributed as profits. That's what makes it for-profit. A, a, a non-profit corporation really does the same sort of thing, except for the fact that there's no one to distribute anything left over. Everything is actually plowed back into the the, the, the purpose of the entity. Um, but you know, groups such as the NCAA are, are labeled non-profit. And trust me, they're trying to make as much money as possible. Uh, non-profit institutions, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hofstra University, I, uh, for example, where I work, you know, they're trying to maximize revenue for the purpose of the mission of the school. So mm. you know, in terms of the daily operations, the difference between the two is really not that profound. Um, and so, yes, I think that to, to grant one uh, group these rights and, and to deny it to another is, um, is, is, is questionable, you know, from a constitutional basis. Yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me as someone who who occasionally teaches nonprofit organizations is that, is that in a lot of ways, the fundamental difference between a charitable and non-charitable corporation is the content of the purposes clause. And so far as a charity has to have the purpose being, you know, dedicated to the public good, whereas a private corporation has to have its purpose, well, can have its purpose essentially as being whatever it wants to. And we've kind of come to this expectation that a private corporation is going to have a sort of generic purposes clause. But as you point out in your paper, there's there's nothing mandating that. And in fact, that that too is a relatively, you know, relatively recent development. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's a key point. I, I am not, you know, I, I speak about this a lot, not, not surprisingly. Um, I'm not of the opinion that every single corporation that exists in the world ought to have First Amendment free exercise rights and ought to be uh, deemed a religious entity. And, and we can go into that in some detail if you wish. What I am suggesting, though, is exactly as you put it, um, corporations get to define their purpose, right? They get to define their their, their values, their mission, and um, many choose to define it in a way that's religious. And I don't see why that shouldn't be taken as authentic. And, and if it is authentic, um, I think there ought to be repercussions from that. And, and in fact, um, the trend is today, right, with, with socially responsible investing and, you know, green investing and whatnot, the trend is toward, I think, uh, corporations that, uh, you know, ostensibly do take on a, a characteristic or or values that go beyond merely profit maximization. I mean, uh, you have green companies, right, uh, that, that are trying to reduce their carbon footprint. Nobody doubts that, uh, and, 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 and everybody sees that, and, and investors will flock to that company because it is green. Well, similarly, you have companies, let's say, like you know, Chick-fil-A or Hobby Lobby, that kind of wear certain religious values on their sleeve. And, and, and similarly, customers and, and investors might flock to those companies for those reasons. So I, I just see this as, if anything... Um, uh, sort of a trend now. 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's also mm-hmm. a trend, I think, among workers. And this is um, a part I try to, a point I try to make in the article too. I, I sense that there's a t- pendulum has, has sort of swung too far in another direction, right? I talked about the great divorce of, you know, faith from work, and okay, that's true. But a lot of people today are looking for meaning in, in kind of all that they do, right? And they're they're very conscious of the companies they're patronizing, the companies they're investing in, and what do we do with most of our time? We work. And so many people today are very conscious of the companies for which they work, and they want to they want to work for a company uh, whose values they they support or at least are comfortable with. And so I I think you you have a coming together of investors, you know, capital, uh, workers, and even customers uh, around an idea of a, of a particular corp that is a particular corporation that I would suggest gives gives rise to a, an association, if you will, uh, a genuine association. And in the way that de Tocqueville would consider an association uh, a, a really important part of our society. And so um, I think there's a lot going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, a, a lot of the pushback, at least from what I've seen, to um, sort of recognizing – corporate first amendment rights you know usually people talk about free speech but i think as you point out increasingly freedom of expression and freedom of uh, association are becoming part of that conversation as well uh a, a lot of critics will say well those are those are rights that belong to people and corporations can't have or exercise those rights and 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 you talk about why that's a misunderstanding of how corporations work and the kind of fundamental nature of a corporation. I was wondering if you could get into that a little bit, specifically in relation to to freedom of association, because I thought you had some really interesting points to make there. Oh, well, thank you. Well, let me just, if I may just mention something that I think is an interesting sort of a piece of trivia about this. I, I've been thinking about writing an article about this for, for, for many years. Once I, I entered the academy in 2006, and my, and my law review note way back in Law school was on the priest penitent privilege, right? So these church state issues are something I've been interested in in a very long time. But but when I got back to the academy, uh, when I, I returned as a professor, if you will, I, I had thought about writing an article about something like this for a while. But the Citizens United uh, case was working its way through the courts, and I was saying to myself, I, you know, let me see how this turns out, right? Because if if the Supreme Court says that corporations do not have a First Amendment right of free speech. And the question of free exercise is probably moot, or at least going to be a really hard argument to, to make. So I was I was sort of sitting on that, and then in 2010, the Supreme Court came out with the Citizens United decision, and that's when I said, okay, I have to now I have to write this article because it's now it's a viable uh, option, right? That this this concept of free exercise rights for a first of, for a, a business corporation. So I started writing this article, and as I wrote this, as I was writing this article, uh, the the Hobby Lobby case was percolating. It was I think before the the appellate courts at the time and hadn't reached the Supreme Court yet. So um, you call the article timely and it, and it was even back then. And I was so happy to get it out just in time um, before these, it was ultimately decided by the Supreme Court, which as we know how that came out, the Supreme Court decided uh, that religious corporations can indeed uh, assert, uh, well, I don't say first amendment rights. Let's just say religious liberty rights under RIFRA. That's a statutory claim, but it's cut from a similar cloth, a similar argument. But anyway, back to your question. A, a lot of people do debate, you know, or or, or contest the, the the appropriateness of these rights. You know, how can a corporation engage in free exercise of religion? And and as I touched on earlier, um, I think it depends on how you view religion, and different people have different understandings. Look, if you view religion as something completely private between a person and the, and their God, well, then, uh, yeah, the idea of a corporate a corporation exercising religion is is odd, but not everybody views religion that right, way, right? A lot of people see religion as uh, intrinsically collective and and congregational, if you will. Um, and so, uh, to those folk, uh, you know, uh, religion is to be practiced in common. And so, people see, you know, the word vocation uh, originally has a religious com- connotation, a, a calling. Some people see their their calling, let's say, to be as to be a business leader, a, an entrepreneur, and to found a corporation with certain religious values. And if folks flock to that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think that can indeed be a genuinely religious association. Yes, I do. Right, right. So how <clears throat> how is your position or your, your take on this issue developed after the court's ruling 
in Hobby Lobby? And where, where do you think the next steps might be? Oh, that's a, thank you for asking that. So when this came out, as I said, Hobby Lobby was in the wings. It was percolating through the appellate courts. Nobody knew how it would turn out at the Supreme Court. And so in this piece, I was laying out the, the argument for why there ought to be corporate free exercise rights. And so the Supreme Court uh, uh, concluded that there ought to be. And so that, that, that was a huge shift, right? So what was once unknown has now been resolved to a degree, to a degree. Uh, there are some questions less, left unanswered, and I think that's where we're going. But in terms of my scholarship, given the reaction against uh, Hobby Lobby by some of my colleagues and, and many uh, fellow you know, citizens who don't think this is appropriate, I shifted gears and I've been, I've been working hard to find a way to bridge the gap. In other words, are there limiting principles on this right, that would make it more palatable to those who oppose it while retaining the goodness of, of, of recognizing these rights? So, so what I've been doing, so, and my latest article that just came out, my most recent piece published in the St. John's Law Review, uh, is called an antitrust approach to corporate free exercise, and and that's um, and that article picks up from the from the you know picks up with where this left off, saying, look, at this point, well, picks up where Hobby Lobby left off, saying the Supreme Court now has made clear that first um, um, that business corporations may indeed assert religious liberty rights, uh, and 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 again, please don't let me let this go. I do want to follow up on your second part of the question of where where the law is going, sure. but but in terms mm -hmm. of my scholarship, I said, okay, now it's been decided that business corporations can indeed exercise First Amendment rights. Now let me look at a way to sort of um, handle the rough edges of that because the, the, mm. the, the biggest rough edge, I think, is third-party harms, right? You have a business corporation like the um, – or a, a business entity like Masterpiece Cake Shop that says, we, you know, we don't want to uh, sell uh, cakes uh, for, for same-sex weddings. Uh, you have photographers like Elaine Photography – um, say we don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to sell our services to for for, for same sex uh, uh, wedding ceremonies and whatnot. And and you know, th these are major major issues. We're dealing with conflicts of rights, right? The the, the right of citizens to equal tr treatment, uh, anti discrimination laws, and then the First Amendment or free exercise rights of religious owners. So I see this clash as a humongously, uh, it's a, a horribly huge clash. And and I, I'd love for the law to sort of try to resolve it. My colleagues on one side or the other like one size fits all answers for the most part. They like, you know, the religious owner should always win or the, the, the customer, uh, the same sex couple should always win. I'm trying so hard to thread the needle. And so my scholarship has been going in that direction. How can we find a way to, um, to, to, to reach some compromise here? And, and so, and, and this is why I've had so much fun in this area. I, and I feel I've, I've have a sort of a, a I dare say a competitive advantage or, or whatnot, you know, as a business lawyer before I entered the academy, uh, you know, I, I have an understanding of sort of business law and how businesses work and, and, and the types of issues that most antitrust scholars don't really, I'm sorry, that most First Amendment scholars or religious scholars don't really think about. Uh, and so I think about stuff like antitrust. That's something I practiced on when I was an associate. And antitrust law, actually, I think, has a lot to tell us about how we might be able to solve this problem. Because think about what antitrust law tries to do. Antitrust law tries to promote competition in, in general by prohibiting unfair competition in, in particular. I mean, talk about a balancing act, right? Um, right. And so what I try to use, I, I try to use some of the wisdom in that to say, well, maybe there's something that can be learned here and a way to apply certain sort of principles so that whether the religious claimant wins or the, 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 the same sex couple wins or what have you, or the woman seeking birth control, you know, you, what, what have you, you pick this scenario, what, whether, you know, how those cases ought to be determined, I suggest should be in a very specific, specific uh, case by case fa fact based uh, inquiry. Mm. So, so that's where I'm going with that. And again, it doesn't please everybody. In fact, you know, I think most people probably don't like it because nobody wins all the time. Um, you know, and so in a nutshell, what, what drives that I think the decision ought to be market power as it does in market in, in antitrust. I, my, my suggestion is if you're dealing with a business corporation that has tremendous market power such that the consumers in question or the parties claiming discrimination against them in question really don't have anywhere else to go. I think that's a radically different situation than a situation where a, a business has no market power. You know, there's tons of competitors and 
and the consumer can literally go across the street to get the goods or services that they want. I think those are two very different set of circumstances that ought to have constitutional uh, implications. So that that's where my scholarship's right. going, Brian. Um, as, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I yeah. went on. No, no, that was fantastic. Um, and, and I think that that's a really fair point. I mean, it's like, you know, sometimes the right solution is actually the one that makes nobody Yes, happy. and it's very messy and it's hard work, but I think the values at stake on all sides here are such that it's worth the work. You know, it's, we've got to get, we want to get this as right as possible. Um, and, and now as to your question where the law is going, well, I will, a couple of things I, I like to mention for the, the sake of the listeners that they might not, that hasn't come up. So the first amendment uh, is, is that provision of the constitution that says Congress shall make no law regarding uh, a variety of rights we cherish, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of association, excuse me, and also freedom, the free exercise of religion. Now, be, without going, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because it's it's very convoluted and complicated. The Supreme Court ultimately ruled that 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 clause, the free exercise clause, doesn't mean as much as many people thought it meant. The Supreme Court ultimately concluded that the protections aren't as profound as prior precedent had. And that's a that's a redundant, but as 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 precedent has suggested. And uh, and so the Supreme Court basically narrowed our our nation's understanding of of that clause. And in response, Congress essentially unanimously, uh, with widespread support, passed what's known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. And what RIFRA does is it attempts to restore, on a statutory basis, uh, the First Amendment free exercise rights as they existed before the Supreme Court mucked things up, according to its. Uh, the, the, no, the legislative intent behind RIFRA. So, and that was in 1990. The Smith decision is the one where the Supreme Court, let's say, narrows our understanding of the free exercise clause. So, what happened in the Hobby Lobby case by a 5 4 vote, since the free exercise clause has been uh, interpreted very narrowly since 1990, uh, the claimants in, in, in the Hobby Lobby case, and that was the case where the Affordable Care Act contraceptive mandate was being challenged by Hobby Lobby and other businesses that didn't want to dispense every form of birth control uh, that the uh, Affordable Care Act required them to dispense. There were a few that they quibbled with. Um, they, they said they were abortiofacient, what have you. The Supreme Court said that, look, we're not going to look at the First Amendment because this claim can be resolved under RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so the Supreme Court decided the Hobby Lobby decision on the basis of RIFRA, a, a, a congressional statute. They also decided when the context of what's known as a closed corporation, meaning a corporation that's held by just a few stockholders and is not publicly traded. So two humongous, big open questions going forward would be, one, uh, would a business corporation have the right to assert uh, a, a free exercise clause argument under the free exercise clause, meaning, you know, without recourse to RIFRA, right? Would they be able to do that? Um, the Supreme Court has suggested they could in the Masterpiece Cake Shops case that came out last term. They suggested they could. But, and the second question that's open is, well, what about a publicly traded corporation? Because the facts of Hobby Lobby not, did not involve a large publicly traded corporation, but a small privately held one, right? And so it, it remains to be seen whether a publicly traded corporation could could avail itself of, let's say, religious liberty rights. Yeah, so I, I was wondering about that as I, I read your paper. And I was wondering, like, if you would maybe prognosticate for me, right? So, like, imagine the situation where you've got a publicly traded corporation that was formed with an explicit corporate purposes clause to say, this is a corporation for the promotion of Christianity and making money, yep. right? Um, no, go ahead. <laughs> you know, how do you think? I mean, how do you think courts would approach or decide a free exercise related challenge in relation to a corporation of that kind? Because I don't see any reason why you couldn't form a corporation with that in its purposes clause. Absolutely. Right? And and so I think you see where I'm going to come out on this. I, I, I do think that such a, and again, I'm, I'm, I talk about possibilities, right? I, like you, I, I foresee the possibility of such an entity existing. And if it does come to light, I think it ought to have First Amendment or religious liberty rights, whether it's under RIFRA or the First Amendment. I, I really do. Um, 
however, um, I could see a reason why the court, court might not want to go there. So, uh, and here's why. And it, it has to do with, you started this conversation early on, you asked about, you know, people think of free exercise rights as limited to people and not businesses. And I tried to explain how, well, I think an association is, you know, is, is, is a special type of entity that ought to have these rights. Well, as you move from a small privately held corporation, let's say owned by a handful of family members, right, to a, a truly public corporation whose stock is trading on the New York Stock Exchange, it does feel a lot less like an association and a lot less like a, you know, uh, something that's deserving of these rights and more like a, a quasi public institution. And so, you know, that, that, so I think that's, that's a reason that could get why courts might uh, have, you know, give pause and say, I don't know if this, maybe we are going too far now. Uh, maybe it stretches the imagination too much. I don't think so because for crying out loud, the Catholic mm -hmm. church, you know, with a billion people is a pretty large organization and it's, it's, yeah. you know, ostensibly religious, right? So I don't think that size is necessarily, uh, you know, suggests you can't be religious because you're really you can't be a religious organization just because you're really large. Uh, I don't see that, but but I, I could see the court saying, you know, let's let's draw the line at, at privately held corporations just because once they're publicly traded, it, it's now just such a different beast that we don't want to go there. But I don't think that'd be a very principled line, uh, Brian. I think it would be more of a um, a, a just a feel. You know, a feeling, a, a sort of a gut check issue. I don't think there's a principled basis to draw that line, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it struck me really reading your paper that there is this kind of like no one, no one even thinks to question, in a sense, the idea that a charitable corporation could have sort of the corporate equivalent of a belief. I mean, they're they're written right into the you know the mission of the organization. Sometimes written right into the to the corporate charter of the organization. And at the same time, everyone sort of accepts as the gospel that the fundamental purpose of a business corporation is shareholder wealth maximization. But really that's a description, not <laughs> not an actual purpose. I mean, nothing says that has to be the purpose of a business corporation. We've just sort of observed that that's sort of the center of gravity of where business corporations tend to go. But the law doesn't say that has to be the purpose. And it seems like on the story you're telling, and I think you're right that there really is a kind of a continuum between um, business corporations and charitable corporations. There's no reason not to think that business corporations couldn't have the same kinds of normative values embedded in them that we're perfectly comfortable seeing in a charitable corporation. And in a sense, it seems to me that that actually kind of enriches our vision of what a corporation is oh, for. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, again, you hit the nail on the head. It is a description and it's a choice, right? Most corporations do indeed choose to exist for the purpose of maximizing wealth to enrich the shareholders, but that's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be. There's nothing in corporate law that forces them to do that. What corporate law forces the directors who run the corporation to do is to abide by the corporate charter, right? To fulfill their fiduciary duties as set out uh, in the charter. And if the charter says this this corporation exists to balance the spread of the gospel with the with the um you know the the uh the the, the earning of profits well that's what it's ought to, that's what the, they ought to do and and in fact you know another development that I was re I was remiss in not mentioning is this concept of the benefit corporation I I mention it in passing in this article because it was just coming out but today many more states have enacted what's known as benefit corporation legislation which allows in case there were any doubt, like Brian, you and I agree that corporations do not have to exist solely to maximize profits. They can choose to have a religious purpose or some other purpose if they wish. But to some people, that's not been clear. And so state after state, including Delaware now, which is the most influential state in the space when it comes to corporate law, ha have adopted what's known as benefit corporation legislation, which allows a business corporation to explicitly identify itself as one that does not maximize profits, but rather balances profits with some other uh, moral or socioeconomic or environmental objective. So, mm. uh, you know, that's, that's, to me, that's really compelling. 
to, to say, at least if you're a benefit corporation. So if, if you're an old fashioned corporation, a traditional business corporation, we'll call it. If people want to say that you, you have to maximize your profits because that's what the law says, I would say, well, A, you're wrong, but B, okay, for argument's sake, let's, let's, I'll give you that. But what about for a benefit corporation? If, if we want to incorporate as a benefit corporation, will you grant to me that this corporation may indeed be authentically religious because that's written into its charter as permitted by the law of that very state that in which it's incorporated? So I think that's a, another important mm. development here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it struck me that you know one sort of interesting example of a weirdly hybrid entity would be something like the Church of Scientology, right? Yep. They're interesting that way. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, rather, I, I don't know too much about them other than what I hear uh -huh. from the celebrity gossip pages. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I just mean in the sense that, you know, it's an explicitly religious organization that nonetheless has maximizing profit as one of its tenets. Um, so they seem to actually weirdly kind of occupy in some analogous sense, sort of the space that you're talking about. And the IRS has always seemed to struggle with how to characterize the church for the purpose of taxation. Okay, fair point. Very good point. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So in, in, in concluding our conversation, I was wondering if I could ask you to prognosticate just one more time and let us know where do you think this is going to where, where do you think this is going next? What's going to happen next? What's the next fight going to be? And what do you so think? So the happen? next fight I think will be masterpiece cake shop two, like the, the, the sequel, because what happened originally in this important case and masterpiece cake. So with the Hobby Lobby case that, uh, I know there are many that won't agree with me on this. Obviously, you know, people don't agree with anything uh, these days. But but in in Hobby Lobby, I think it was sort of easier to side with Hobby Lobby because that issue was the provision of 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 birth control, and and the government, the Supreme Court concluded, look, look, government, there are so many ways to get birth control into the hands of folks. Do you really have to do it through the insurance policies? Uh, the health insurance policy is promulgated by a company. It was very easy to sort of minimize the third party harms there, right? The government could just provide it for free mm -hmm. or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So Hobby Lobby, although it offended a lot of folks who felt that this was going to make it harder for folks to get birth control, there really is an easy way around that. Um, okay. Masterpiece Cake Shop, there's no easy way around it because in the Masterpiece Cake Shop situation, you have the the parade of horribles uh, starting. You have a a, a religious business uh, a, a, a bakery saying we are not going to serve. Well, actually, there's been so much mis, so much misreporting about it. The, in all these cases, just to be clear, and I, I think this should get out. In, in the cases where you have same-sex couples going to wedding vendors, let's say for um, for goods and services relating to their wedding, just to be clear, in every one of these cases that's thus far, the record has been in, in very clear that the business owners never had a problem selling or servicing uh, their their homosexual LGBT clientele. Never had a problem. They would sell them birthday cakes. They'd sell them, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of happy, you know, happy congratulations for this cake. And they, they knew that the orientation of their employee, their, their customers, and they still service them uh, as well as anybody else. They only drew a line and all these cases come to come to the court where they draw a line with regard to helping out or selling a goods or service with regard to an actual same-sex wedding. So again, some people don't think there's a difference in there in that situation. I think most fair-minded people would say that's a little different. They're not just saying we refuse to service anyone who's LGBT. We just refuse to um, be, have anything to do with a, a same-sex wedding. And, and, and why? For religious principles. And, and, and to pretend that weddings and marriages haven't historically had sort of religious significance is, I think, just just not intellectually honest. So uh, I think it's a good faith claim on their part. It doesn't mean they should win, of course. So where are we going to go? In the So you had the case came up where a, a same-sex couple asked for a wedding cake. Masterpiece Cake Shop said no. The, the Civil Rights Commission of uh, Colorado um, um, slammed Masterpiece Cake Shop for what it did, saying you're violating our state's um, our state's anti-discrimination laws. This went to the Supreme Court. Masterpiece Cake Shop won kind of sort of on a technicality. And here's the technicality. The Civil Rights Commission, and I, I, might, not getting, I might not be getting the name correct, but the, 
the government authority in Colorado that ruled against the, the cake shop for the denial of service, the record was pretty clear. There was some animosity in the record against religion uh, by some of the statements of the commissioners. And, and you can't have that. That's one thing that everyone agrees the First Amendment prohibits. You, you, when you decide these cases as a government entity, you've got to be uh, fair-minded and reasonable. You can't have an anti-religious bias. And the record was suggestive of an anti-religious bias. And so the case was um, Masterpiece Cake Shop 1. The, the court said, we have to overturn these fines. We have to overturn these, these judgments against you because the record is just replete with bias against you as a religious actor. And, and there was a, a lopsided majority. I want to say it was something like seven to two in favor of uh, the defendant Masterpiece Cake Shops in that case. Okay, fine. But the, the substantive issue, though, was never really resolved, right? Can a, really, uh, a business owner de- deny service to, let's say, a same-sex couple or to someone who wants, uh, you know, you, you name it, you name the situation on the basis of their religious relief. Can you get a religious exemption from the anti-discrimination laws? That's the next case that's going to be before the Supreme Court, the next, the, the next important case on this issue. And I, I'm not sure how that's going to come out. Um, I do think with the appointments, quite frankly, it's, it's, an, it's a counting game to, in, in part, right? I, I do think with Gorsuch mm-hmm. and Kavanaugh, uh, I I do think the court's likely to. Well, what I hope the court does is read my article on an antitrust approach <laughs> and, and, and cite, cite it several, several times, times and says, you know what? If you're the only baker in town, you've got to serve him. But if there's a guy across the street that'll serve him, you know, maybe in that case, uh, you don't have to serve them, right? And I, I, that that and that's kind mm. of the, the the essence of my latest scholarship on the piece. It depends on you know market power and whatnot, but. I, I don't know how they'll come out, but I imagine it will be a 5-4 decision. That's the only thing I'm willing to say. I think it'll be a 5-4 decision. <laughs> I don't know if yeah, I don't know if one of the conservatives will flip and say we just can't have the anti-discrimination laws, you know, let's say eviscerated this way. Uh, but I could also see them saying that, you know what? Whose rights are being whose rights are really imperiled here? You know, is this is this, is it true this couple can't get cake anywhere because of their their sexual orientation? Or is the issue that you as a, let's say, an evangelical business owner, you know, can't ply your trade in a way that comports with your, your beliefs? Like, you know, who, who really is, you know, has more to lose here? And, and I, uh, mm-hmm. so I think, I, you know, that's, that's the essence of my latest piece of scholarship on the subject. So I, I can't tell you how, I can tell you that's going to be the next big case, though. And I, I do think it'll be 5-4, but that's as far as I'm willing to go. Okay. Okay. Well, from your mouth to the Supreme Court's ears. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ron. It's been a pleasure it's talking to you. It's been a delight. You. Thank you so much. Americans know about the four freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom to worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. But have you ever thought about what our life would be like without a fifth freedom, our freedom of mobility? As Americans, we have the freedom to go where we want, when we want, and how we want. That's pretty important, isn't it? We don't usually make a big deal out of it, though, probably because we don't have all the economic and political restrictions on travel that people face in other countries. I mean, here we just hop in our car or buy a ticket on a train or plane, and we're on our way. On our way to the store, to work, on our way to the beach or mountains, to grandma's, to church, and to go hunting or fishing or skiing or bowling, to see a drive-in movie, or maybe just for an afternoon drive in the country. What would happen if something, if anyone, put a roadblock in our way? What would happen if we lost our freedom of mobility? Well, for one thing, a lot of people you know would be out of work, one out of every six Americans who make their living from the automotive industry. Another thing would happen, too, if we lost our automotive mobility. The quality of our society would deteriorate. Church attendance would fall off. The Rotary Club, the Kiwanis, the Elks, and all the other civic groups and organizations would cancel their meetings. Sports events would have empty seats. Theaters and concert halls would be empty. Unbelievable, you say? How can this happen? It can happen, for example, if our energy supply runs dry, if our highways and our means of transportation aren't kept up to date, It can happen if our government policies don't continue to place high priority on automotive transportation, 
And it can happen if our policymakers forget the vital importance of our precious fifth freedom. As always, it's up to us, the American people, to protect and preserve our freedoms. We have to remind our leaders over and over again what freedom of mobility means to us and to our country. There is no one else to do it except us.